On October 15, 2011, Japanese game developer and publisher Level 5 held their first independent gaming expo. Founded in 1998, the company had spent less than a decade strictly developing, releasing titles like Dark Cloud, Dragon Quest VIII, and Rogue Galaxy. Most of these early works were developed for the PlayStation 2, but in late 2006, Level 5 broadened their scope to include games publication as well. In turn, they shifted the bulk of their attention to the Nintendo DS. By 2011, Level 5 had established themselves as a niche yet important developer and publisher for Japan. They had helmed successful stories like Professor Layton, Inazuma Eleven, and Nino Kuni, with the first main entry into this latter series set for release only a month following 2011's Level 5 World event. This day of publicity was designed to show off new developments for pre-established releases like Nino Kuni for PlayStation 3, as well as to show off upcoming titles for the first time. Nestled among all these flashy new trailers was one which stuck out from the rest, a quaint title about a boy meeting a ghost butler and a spirit cat, called Yokai Watch. Though the title changed quite a bit from this initial pitch to what audiences received in 2013, the game was originally planned for a PlayStation 3 release, but saw release on the Nintendo 3DS ultimately. This was our first introduction to a brand new world of gaming excitement. A world more familiar than one might expect, but one full of wonderment like few others. The concept was simple. In this version of our world, spiritual beings called yokai inhabit every nook and cranny of people's lives. Some are based upon classical yokai of Japanese folklore, while others are original ideas from the game's creators and designers. These rascally yokai can explain away the annoyances and absurdities of daily life as they inspirit individuals. There's one who can make you insatiably hungry, another who will make you compulsively pick your nose, yet another who makes you tell the whole truth, and another who will make you utterly forgetful. The series' original main character, Keita, known as Nate in the English translation, acquires a device known as the Yokai Watch, which allows him not only to detect the yokai, but to communicate with them. When Keita befriends yokai, he'll even acquire what are called their yokai medals, their personal calling cards, more or less, which he can then use with the watch to summon them. Together, Keita and the yokai work to uncover the mysteries of strange occurrences around his hometown, Springdale in the English. By extension, the yokai and Keita help to stop any ill-intentioned yokai from causing actual harm, hoping to turn their lives around and befriend them instead. Yokai Watch has been around for less than a decade as of today, but the impact it has had is larger than one might think, especially one living in America who might have written off Yokai Watch as a Pokemon clone, which was dead on arrival when it reached our shores in 2015. Yokai Watch quickly spiraled into a multimedia endeavor spanning video games, manga, multiple anime series and films, and a succession of popular toy lines. Truth be told, as of 2020, it hasn't really slowed down in its home country. Today, join us as we look over the history of the quaint yet weighty franchise known as Yokai Watch and examine how the series got from that 2011 Level 5 World trailer to its current status as an international success of varying degrees. Level 5 founder, president, and CEO Akihiro Hino was the progenitor of the idea for the Yokai Watch, which he envisioned first and foremost as a video game series. Speaking on why he chose yokai as the subject of the first game, Hino said, quote, Yokai are spooky beings which often appear in Japanese folklore, mostly related to either humans or objects we were once attached to. Though they are somewhat monster-like, I realized they had never been featured in video games. End quote. He went on to explain, quote, To Japanese people, yokai aren't monsters precisely. They're a more special kind of thing. In the past, we used the term to refer to the personified souls of people, animals, or things that made contact with and grew attached to people." End quote. It was this utilitarian view, perhaps, that helped Hino come up with the idea for each yokai to have a unique ability that would affect combat 
while also having a practical application in daily life. For any kid playing Yokai Watch, it wouldn't be difficult to comprehend or visualize these beings actually existing and causing the stranger parts of life which aren't as easily explained. If a kid couldn't get up in the morning unexpectedly, or if they seemingly lost their homework, the creatures of Yokai Watch would provide a playful means of explaining these difficulties, as Hino explained, quote, In order to write a story which can be relatable to kids, we conducted robust kids' research to understand them. We tried hard to capture what they are most concerned about. It was interesting to find concerns which I can relate to my childhood days, and the ones which were unique to kids today." End quote. As it turned out, Hino wasn't only trying to craft a game to apply to children. He went on to say that, quote, Yokai Watch is something that the whole family can enjoy together. From the very beginning, we developed Yokai Watch to be a cross-media project and not just a video game. End quote. The idea seemed to be that Level 5 would develop and publish video games capable of appealing to children and their parents alike. The setting, characters, and themes were designed to be playful and harmless enough to be understood by and appealing to children. Yet the gameplay is robust enough and sometimes difficult to the point of remaining engaging for adults. At the same time, if the games didn't appeal to a parent or their child both, there were plenty of other options. Each iteration of the franchise, between the games, the manga, and the anime, was controlled by a different creator, meaning that each take on Yokai Watch offers a unique perspective on the series' premise, especially once different spin-offs started getting introduced into the mix. This means that if one avenue didn't work for an individual, they could always seek out another. From the get-go, there were plenty of options to choose from. The first proper entry into the Yokai Watch franchise was the manga series, written by Noriyuki Konishi, an author who seems to be known primarily for his adaptive manga based on other original properties. His version of Yokai Watch now sits at 17 volumes and continues to be serialized in Koro Koro comic. This manga introduced the world to Sakura Newtown and Keita, a self-described utterly normal boy, whose life gets flipped upside down when he encounters a capsule machine in the woods. Here he meets the ghost butler, Whisper, who helps Keita discover the world of yokai living alongside his family and classmates. With the help of his trusty yokai pad, Whisper offers Keita insight into who these yokai are and what their behavior might indicate, though admittedly he's entirely reliant on the pad, not actually knowing much by his own devices. Six months into the manga's run, the main event of the series debuted, Yokai Watch for the 3DS. Released on July 11, 2013 in Japan, Yokai Watch hit the ground running. The game was produced, written, and designed by Hino, and directed by Ken Motomura, who had earlier served as the director on Nino Kuni Wrath of the White Witch. The first Yokai Watch game follows the same setup as the manga. Keita goes about discovering the watch and meeting Whisper alongside the world of Yokai and series mascot Jibanyan, a cat who has a penchant for picking fights with box trucks at the intersection where he died. The player journeys with this group all across Sakura Newtown and the surrounding areas, ferreting out strange occurrences. Players can set up a team of 6 Yokai out of a possible 223 available to befriend in the game. Befriending works by feeding a yokai its favorite type of food during battle, beating it, and then hoping that luck is on your side. The game also contains five legendary yokai and five special QR code based yokai, which are attained differently. The legendaries are unlocked once certain sets of other yokai medals are placed in the player's medallion, the name for their medal book. The special jeweled neons, on the other hand, are made available by using one's 3DS to scan the QR codes attached to the jewel neon figurines. This will cause the jewel neons to appear in-game, at which point they can be battled, fed, and befriended like any other yokai. With such a hefty roster right out of the box, Yokai Watch certainly seemed to be putting the right foot forward. As Akihiro Hino explained in an interview, he hoped the series would quickly become the Doraemon of the current generation. He hoped it would be loved by not only the present generation of kids, but be passed on for years to come. Longevity was the operative word here, with Hino and Level 5 dropping a fairly robust first entry so early in the franchise's lifespan, allowing them plenty of room for expansion upon a solid foundation. 
Perhaps the most notable departure introduced by Yokai Watch, which set it apart from other RPGs, especially other team-building, monster-collecting RPGs, is the manner in which the game handles its battle system. While Keita is allowed to call six yokai at a time, only three are allowed to be on the field at the same time. They're placed on a wheel so that the player cannot pick and choose just any three to put in play at once. Instead, they must strategize which yokai stand next to which others for the sake of always having a healer in the party, or gaining bonuses from having three yokai of the same tribe together. At any given time, the player is allowed to perform a number of different actions. At any given time, the player is allowed to perform a number of different actions, set pins on enemies whom your yokai will then target, use items on your own yokai to assist them, or on enemy yokai to feed and potentially befriend them, activate a yokai's ultimate attack, their individual meter-based special, or purify your yokai who have been inspirited by enemies, with inspiriting being this game's equivalent of status effects. You might notice one specific exception here. As Hino explained, quote, You don't become the yokai, you make friends with them, and they fight for you. It helps bring across the idea that you're taking the director role in the game. End quote. In other words, the yokai are not your pets or your possessions, they are your friends. They have their own will, meaning they choose when and who to attack or heal, and they decide when they are too tired or bored to fight and begin loafing. If nothing else, this subtle difference between Yokai Watch and other monster collecting RPGs positioned this series to be a world apart from these other games. Only a week after the smash success of the first Yokai Watch in Japan, a small mobile game was released. Released July 18, 2013, Yokai Taiso Daiichi Puzzle Da Nian is a puzzle game featuring the first ending theme song from the as yet unreleased anime. This song, Yokai Exercise Number no. 1, aka Taiso Daiichi, would go on to be a hit in its own right. At the time, it served as the soundtrack to a relatively simple, small game compared with how the series would later evolve with its spin offs, with one other coming out within the same calendar year. A Data Cardass series based around Yokai Watch hit the Japanese market in late 2013, with a wide release in 2014. As of 2020, these arcade machines can be found fairly easily all over Japan, with a machine locator available on the game's website. This series of cards and arcade cabinets is one of the many, many Cardass games produced by Bandai over the years. They've adapted other popular franchises like Dragon Ball, Yu-Gi-Oh!, Bleach, and countless others. Cardass has been around since 1988, with the idea being that there are pieces of data included on each card which interact with the Cardass arcade machines. This means that players can use physical cards to interact with the Bandai's proprietary arcade machines, giving them a souvenir which has a use beyond just looking pretty. Yokai Watch's version of Cardass, Tomodachi Ukiukipedia, plays similar to a stripped back version of the main game's battle system. Players use three cards to summon a small team of yokai who then battle against three other opponents. If the player is successful, the machine will reward them with another card, which they can in turn use in subsequent play sessions. Since the release of Tomodachi Ukiukipedia, there have been a number of updates and new card sets released by Bandai to coincide with new releases for the main series. As of this writing, a Cardus set based upon the most recent iteration of Yokai Watch has been available in Japan for several months. As 2013 drew to a close, marking the end of Yokai Watch's first full year in the limelight, the franchise sat poised to begin its third major medium. Yokai Watch was by now already a bona fide success, with a popular manga, a popular video game, several spin offs, and a line of toys from Bandai to help promote the property further among children. In early 2014, however, perhaps the most prolific of Yokai Watch's media, its anime adaptation, began broadcast on TV Tokyo. The original anime series began airing in January 2014, six months after the first game was released. Now that all the different components of the franchise were here, it could be said that this was the point at which the series really started to hit it big in Japan. Each piece had its part to play, with Akihiro Hino making note of the important function anime can play for a franchise. He explained, quote, Anime is content that is offered for free, and I strongly promote its use. The Yokai Watch anime focuses on problems that modern children face, 
and is made so that the audience can laugh off such problems and be entertained as well." End quote. This means that it offered a brand new inroad for kids who watched anime on television but maybe didn't read serialized manga or pay attention to 3DS games at the time. As with both main components released prior to this, the anime Yokai Watch follows Keita, a normal kid who can't seem to excel at life. He's perhaps more relatable than other anime protagonists because he merely needs to make friends, not conquer the world and capture a group of monsters as in other series of this nature. As Hino put it, quote, Keita isn't a child who always does the right thing, but has his own flaws as well, like trying to watch naughty TV shows late at night or making fun of people. Keita's actions are depicting what is normal for modern children. He's not a good boy, but someone who says what he thinks. I believe that character setting made him very relatable to people." End quote. And while Keita might be the main fulcrum of the show's events, its structure is significantly more fragmented than one might expect. The first video game introduced two types of side quests, requests and favors. Requests are the more traditional side quests which become available at specific times and can only be completed once. Favors, on the other hand, will seemingly just appear and can be completed multiple times if the player wishes to do so. We bring this up because the structure of the Yokai Watch anime seems to be based upon the idea of requests and favors rather than a main storyline. Any given episode is composed of three or four segments, which are completely unrelated to one another. Frequently, a miniseries will appear over the course of half a dozen episodes or so, with their continuity usually relying on retelling similar jokes with variations between each mini-episode. The one-offs, on the other hand, usually relate to Keita, Whisper, and Jibanyan meeting new yokai in their own mini-episodes. Outside of recurring gags, the show didn't concern itself too heavily with continuity, mixing things up over time by introducing new characters like Inaho, known as Haley Ann in America, and her yokai companion, Usapion, though this came after quite some time of the show maintaining its status quo. The show ultimately ran for 214 episodes, with three films based around this original run, and before it was replaced by another anime series. Just after the anime debuted on TV Tokyo, another manga series hit the market in the form of Yokai Watch Exciting Neanderful Days, a shoujo series centered around Fumika, or Katie in America. In this alternate universe, Fumika finds the Yokai Watch instead of Keita, and befriends Whisper and Jibanyan on her own. This manga ran for several years, totaling three volumes by the time of its conclusion. Only six months into the anime's initial run and the second manga's initial publication, Yokai Watch 2 hit Japanese store shelves on July 10th, 2014. This entry was again directed by Ken Motomura, with writing duties fulfilled by Akihiro Hino, Yoichi Kato, and Kohei Azuma. This time around, however, there was a notable difference. Similar to what one might expect of Monster Collection games, the title was split in two, seeing release as Ganso and Honke. The former name refers to an originator or pioneer, specifically of a family line. The latter, on the other hand, describes the head household of a family. These titles refer to the main plotline of the game, which revolves around two clans of yokai battling out their differences, placing the player right in the middle and asking them to choose sides. Kino has gone on record to say that this splitting of the sequel was planned as early as during the production and planning of the first game. He even cited the spirit of Pokemon indirectly, arguing that two versions was a good idea because kids generally have different experiences and possessions than one another. He also called back to the idea of kids and parents playing together, claiming that one family having two copies of essentially the same game made sense for this reason. For the most part, Yokai Watch 2 plays like an extended update to the first game, with the majority of the game's mechanics being lifted wholesale from the first entry. The biggest addition in terms of gameplay, perhaps, is a minigame known as Yokai Blasters. This takes the form of an application on the player's Yokai pad, where they can play as their favorite Yokai directly. Rather than coaching them in turn based settings, one here takes direct control and battles other Yokai in an arcade style action brawler. Besides this introduction and some other tweaks to the gameplay, 
The main boasting point for Yokai Watch 2 is how much more massive it is compared with the first game. More maps are available, a whole other town is present, most of the game's areas have a time warp version that can be visited, and almost 400 yokai are available to befriend. Of course, each version of the game has slightly different rosters, and there have been downloadable updates since initial release, which have introduced even more new yokai into the mix. This time, the story is both a sequel and prequel to the first game. A new yokai known as Habernyan is introduced, who comes from 60 years in the past to warn Keita about losing his watch, and the connections between yokai and humans being severed, perhaps forever. As it turns out, Habernyan is a friend of Keita's grandfather, who also turns out to be the original inventor of the yokai watch. Keita and company must travel back and forth between the present and the past to set the record straight and ensure that the watch continues to exist. Upon release, the two versions of Yokai Watch 2 were received as critically well as the first, with sales numbers increasing. Before the year was out, a few more developments for the franchise would emerge, making 2014 another solid year for the series. In October, another short-lived manga was introduced. This one, four-panel Yokai Watch, Gera Gera Manga Theater by Kokonasu Rumba, played on the Japanese format of four-panel comics seen regularly in newspapers often for comedic purposes. This one never made it into translation, which is unfortunate given how positive the Amazon reviews on this single volume are, and how they talk about laughing so hard at the quirky humor on display. Later in the same month, a third version of Yokai Watch 2 was announced in Korokoro Comics, named Shinuchi, this time meaning star, headliner, or main performer. This complete version of the game, another familiar trope for Monster Collection, was released shortly, in December 2014. Two weeks prior to this, an update patch for Ganso and Honke was made available, allowing for transfer of yokai between Shinuchi and the earlier games, as well as adding additional content to these earlier versions. Rounding out the second year of Yokai Watch, audiences also saw the release of the first Yokai Watch theatrical movie, Tanjo no Himitsu da Nyan, which has been translated as It's the Secret of Birth Meow. The film more or less follows the plot of the second game, with a lot of the fat trimmed. It has the main plot about Keita, his grandfather, and Havernyan, but contains almost none of the side plots from the game. Not even the main subplot of the game concerning the two clans makes it into the film, as there's simply not enough time. On the other hand, until the climax, the stories mirror one another more or less completely. In fact, a number of visuals used in the film are lifted from the game directly. Unfortunately, the secret of birth stretches itself thin with juvenile jokes. This was the first time Shinji Ushiro, who served as director on almost all of the anime series and films, attempted to string together a narrative of this length for Yokai Watch. In the end, the first film's 90 minutes can't completely sustain its runtime when compared with the vignettes of the show. Thankfully, this is easily the weakest of the Yokai Watch movies. Even if it was a rocky start, matters would quickly improve with follow-up entries into the series. 2014 was another important year for establishing the roots of Yokai Watch in Japan. Another successful release of a game, the beginning of the first anime series, the release of the first film, and the continued success of the various manga adaptations all marked 2014 as a success in the continued rise of the franchise. 2015 would perhaps be even more pivotal, however as it would offer the series an introduction into English-speaking territories. Before Yokai Watch could make its way west, however, there were a few more detours to be made. In April 2015, a new Yokai Watch announcement was published in Koro Koro, detailing three new titles, Buster's Sangokushi and the third numbered entry in the main series. The first of these, Yokai Watch Busters, was released for the Nintendo 3DS on July 11, 2015. This game, like Yokai Watch 2, was published in two versions Red Cat Team and White Dog Core, with each themed around early series mascots Jibanyan and Komasan, respectively. Busters constituted a full game version of the Blasters minigame previously mentioned from the second game. It was ultimately meant to tide gamers over in the interim between the second and third main entries, given how massive an update the third promised to be. In December 2015, two new updates to the game were released. 
a free DLC update for the 3DS versions titled Moon Rabbit Party, and an arcade version known as Iron Oni Army. The latter of these was co-developed by Level 5 and Cardass, meaning it functions similarly to the other Cardass games released under the Yokai Watch license. Once more, players were able to receive cards for various yokai after each game played. As of 2018, however, the game seems to have been discontinued in favor of the main Yokai Watch Cardass games. Later in 2015, Yokai Watch received another mobile game, Puni Puni, or Wibble Wobble as it's known internationally. Initially launching in October 2015, Yokai Watch Wibble Wobble is a puzzle game that plays in a vastly different manner than any other entry in the series. A matching block puzzler, Wibble Wobble actually became so popular during its international run that outlets like Polygon went so far as to call it the best Yokai Watch game. Wibble Wobble eventually made its way to foreign shores between 2016 and 2017, but was discontinued in 2018 everywhere except Japan, where its servers are supposedly still online. 2015 also saw the debut of three new manga within Japan. Yokai Watch 4-Panel Pun Club, Komasan, and Yokai Watch Busters. The first is another take on the comedic 4-panel formula by Santa Harukaze. The second tells a short, two-volume tale concerning the secondary mascot of the series, Komasan, penned by Sho Shibamoto. And the third was released as a promotion right around the time of the release of the Busters game, written by Atsushi Oba. All three were fairly short-lived, and none of them have been officially translated into English as of yet. On the other hand, after all these side releases and detours, the original game, manga, and anime all finally hit American shores toward the end of the year. The anime was the first to the punch, beginning broadcast on October 5th, 2015. The franchise licenses were shopped around in America as early as 2014, and a handful of different companies secured those rights. Disney for the anime, Nintendo for publication of the games, Hasbro for the toys, and Viz Media for the manga. Given that Disney was handling the release of the anime series, the American dub of the show began its life on Disney XD, and its release went about as well as one hearing that sentence might expect. Seriously though, the anime was said to boast good ratings for a time, enough in fact that Disney ordered three quote-unquote seasons in total, filling a time slot on the extended cable channel for the better part of three years before up and disappearing. The manga was the second version of the series to make it stateside, with Viz releasing the first translated volume on November 3rd, 2015. So far, Viz has released 14 volumes, continuing to hold the American license for the property and not seeming to have any intention of lapsing on it. Besides the main series, however, Viz has never seemed to have much intention of adapting any of the franchise's other manga endeavors. And finally, we had the first game in the series. Released between November 6th, 2015 and April 29th, 2016 throughout America, Australia, and Europe, foreign distribution was handled not by Level 5 as it was within Japan, but by Nintendo, who saw potential in the series after its success at home. With large companies like Viz, Hasbro, Disney, and Nintendo at their back, Hino likely felt as though his property was in good hands. He stated when asked about shipping overseas, quote, We're working in a market packed with both Pokemon and all kinds of other attractive content. So for a new entry like ours, it was going to be challenging no matter what. End quote. For a time, things seemed sweet for Yokai Watch abroad. Hasbro's toys were cluttering store shelves, the manga proved popular among readers. The first game was receiving positive reviews and decent sales and the anime series was posting solid viewership. The American market was ramping up for an even bigger year in 2016, with the first film and a trading card game on the horizon. The film performed… not great when it finally made it over here. It was pitched as a special screening by Eleven Arts through Fathom Events, but let's just say the only countries who raked in less at the box office than America were Thailand and the UAE. The card game was a different issue entirely. Being an original system designed by Hasbro to replace the Cardass and Bandai developed in Spirit Card Battle, which had already received an English release in certain other territories. By virtually all accounts, in Spirit Card Battle is a considerably better game compared with the trading card game, meaning that the lack of importation for In Spirit Card Battle can still be a sore spot for fans of the series. 
Around the same time, Japanese audiences saw the release of the second annual theatrical movie, Eiga Yokai Watchi Enma Daio to Itsu Itsu no Monogatari da Nian. In English, Yokai Watch the movie Lord Enma and the Five Tales, Nian. Director of the show, Shinji Ushiro, here shared directorial duties with Shigeharu Takahashi, with writing by Yoichi Kato, who had worked on the earlier film as well as the television series. Released December 19th, 2015, this film got rid of the single, long story approach of the first and replaced it with five vignettes of different characters, all connected by their tangential relations to the yokai king Enma. The film explores what would happen if Keita became a yokai, if Jibanyan traveled to the future to meet his owner as an adult, if Komasan and Komajiro's mother had a third son, if Usapion was elected as a Santa stand-in, and if these all led to a final battle with King Enma, who wishes desperately to separate the human world from the yokai world. In our humble opinions, this second film is a step up from the first, which benefits greatly by approaching things as an extended episode, borrowing its structure from the TV series. It's unfortunate, given that no films past the first were ever localized outside of Japan, but fan subs are available for all of them, so they're easy enough to view as English speakers once a copy has been acquired. 2015 came to a close, and 2016 began with two more small titles for the series. First came Yokai Watch Dance, just dance special version, on December 5th, 2015. This was a Wii U exclusive developed in collaboration with Ubisoft, which never made it outside of Japan. It featured songs from the series in an effort to both capitalize on the series' popularity and to get kids active. Likely, the game never got localized thanks to the Wii U's lack of popularity, and perhaps licensing issues for the songs used. This is just conjecture, of course. The series was receiving such a push outside of Japan, meanwhile, that it got to the point of achieving region-specific releases outside of Japan. This was the case with Yokai Watch Land, which launched in January 2016 and later in the year throughout Europe. Supposedly, this app was developed by Level 5 Abbey, Level 5's American division, to give fans of the series a replacement for the Yokai pad. Throughout the series, Whisper, and later, another mascot named Usapion, used this device to uncover information about the yokai being encountered at a given moment. In Japan and Korea, Bandai produced a physical version of the pad, capable of scanning the metals packed in with the yokai watch toys to give one the sense that they're looking this information up themselves. There's no clear reason that we could find, but it appears that Hasbro didn't want to adapt the yokai pad for America likely due to the cost involved in such a product. From what we could find, Yokai Watch Land was meant as a stopgap measure so that Yokai Metals could still be scannable, in this case using a smartphone instead of a separate device. For the most part, Yokai Watch Land serves as a collection of minigames with some augmented reality components for use with metals, just like Wibble Wobble, though for different reasons. Yokai Watch Land was removed from circulation at the end of 2018 due to Hasbro pulling support for the franchise and losing the toy rights in America. On April 2nd, 2016, the second of the titles teased in Korokoro, Yokai Sangokushi, was released in Japan. Once again, this one never made it west, unfortunately. This one is a bit of an odd one, truth be told. Sangokushi was published by Level 5, but was actually developed by Koei Tecmo. This developer is the creator of the Romance of the Three Kingdoms series upon which Sangokushi is based, and which has run since 1985. Romance of the Three Kingdoms is a tactical strategy RPG series based on a romanticized view of historical China, with Sangokushi serving as one of the spin-offs from the long-running main series. Instead of dealing with three warring factions, here we have a choice between Jibanyan, Komasan, and Usapion as our military commanders. Given the difference in genre between this and the main series, you might want to give this one a look. In fact, the entire game has been played and verbally translated by Abdallah Smash 026 on YouTube, whose videos and insight were a massive help in constructing this video, not to mention that Abdallah allowed us to use his footage throughout, so be sure to check out his channel if you haven't already. For those who don't speak Japanese, or who don't have a Japanese 3DS, but want to check the game out, be sure to check out his work. 
In fact, he has a number of videos concerning other region-locked games from the franchise, providing a wealth of information and gameplay footage for those interested. While some of the characters presented in Sangokushi had already appeared in the anime or manga, the game contained characters who would make large impacts on the third numbered game. This would give one the indication that Sangokushi was definitely made to coincide with the release of Yokai Watch 3 only a few months later. Yokai Watch 3 was released on July 16th, 2016 in Japan, featuring a brand new setting and boatloads more yokai than either previous game. This time around, Keita and Inaho travel to the US, rather than Japan, and are able to befriend nearly 700 yokai across the three versions released. In Japan, the model set up by Yokai Watch 2 was followed once again. In July, Sushi and Tempura were published, with the third version, Sukiyaki, being released on December 15, 2016. Once the game was eventually localized, Sukiyaki was adapted solely and the subtitles were dropped entirely. Yokai Watch 3 was directed once again by Motomura, designed by Tatsuya Shinkai, who had worked previously on the Professor Layton series, and written by Hino alongside Keitaro Sato. The game changed some mechanics up for the series in terms of its battle system, while also adding a second playable character. This means that Yokai Watch 3 sees the player swapping back and forth between two main characters, rather than selecting one of two and sticking with them throughout. Perhaps most importantly from a marketing perspective, the game boasted a hefty roster of more than 600 yokai to befriend throughout the game's two stories and locales. In between these two release dates for Yokai Watch 3, the American market was finally given their own version of Yokai Watch 2, or, well, versions. In fact, Nintendo was so confident in the game and bolstered by the solid performance of the first entry that they took the plunge and released not one, not two, but all three versions of Yokai Watch 2. The first two, Fleshy Souls and Bony Spirits, hit American store shelves on September 30th, 2016, with European and Oceanic markets following in 2017. The final version, Psychic Spectres, was released in all global markets one year later, in September 2017. These titles didn't end up performing as well as Nintendo likely hoped, but we'll get into that in a bit as we still have a handful of releases to discuss before we examine anything more closely. Next up for the series was the December 17th, 2016 film, Ega Yokai Wachi Sorotobo Kujira to Daburo Sekai no Daibo Ken Danyan. In English, Yokai Watch the movie, The Great Adventure of the Flying Whale and the Double World, Meow. The normal crew of Shinji Ushiro as director and both Yoichi Kato and Akihiro Hino as writers reunited for this project. This time around, they were joined by Takeshi Yokoi, who contributed directorial efforts on an entirely new style of filmmaking for Yokai Watch. With this theatrical release, the formula was shaken up even more than what we saw in the second film. The premise here is that only half of the film is animated, while the other half is live action. Shockingly, this isn't a live action adaptation made for the sake of a quick buck, as so many such anime based projects seem to be. The Flying Whale is, in fact, in canon with the rest of the franchise making it the best live-action anime adaptation we have yet to see. It's not standalone, but has a good reason to be in live-action, given that the film details an encounter between Keita and company and a magical flying whale who can transition the world of Yokai Watch to our world. The live-action segments work here, given the quality of acting on display, as well as the visual direction. The film's CG isn't overly detailed, leaving the live-action portions appropriately cartoonish. In turn, this means that both halves of the film mesh well together. The same goes for the story, not taking itself too seriously. One-off visual gags drive home just how playful the film is, which definitely works in its favor. For example, Keita's friends Bear and Eddie are seen together at one point. Rather than Bear being a large kid, he's portrayed by a middle-aged man, which is acknowledged in the scene itself. Later we see that all yokai powers are weakened in our world, leaving them defenseless. We would also be remiss not to mention that Mangy Mutt is shown to be as horrifying as ever, but is only half CG, with an actual human face plastered on his head. Overall, the film is experimental and playful, offering one of the franchise's absolute high points. Yokai. 
2017 was an uneventful year for the franchise, with no releases coming until late in the year. The anime series and manga were still running strong, yet no new games were published until December. Closing out 2017, Japan received two more games, matching halves of Yokai Busters 2. These two versions, released December 16th, 2017, were titled Sword and Magnum. 2017 was another holdover year for the franchise, without a mainline entry to speak of, which likely explains why Busters made a reappearance at this time. There was no arcade version either, and unfortunately, with the 3DS being dead in 2020, there is likely no official translation for Busters 2 in the works. December arriving also meant that it was time for another of the annual theatrical films, though this year provided another mix-up for the series. In fact, the movie first screened on December 16th, 2017, advanced the timeline for the series another three decades, making this the first part of a sequel series. Eiga Yokai Wochi Shadow Saido Onio no Fukatsu, or as it's known in English, Wrath of the Demon King was the start of a new series known as Shadowside, serving as a proper introduction before manga and anime for Shadowside debuted the following year. You know the drill at this point in terms of staff. What may surprise you, however, is the direction in which this group steered the Yokai Watch ship. Wrath of the Demon King helps introduce Shadowside's new setting, 30 years after the original anime, a new cast of characters, including multiple watch users and even a few people who can use magic without the help of yokai. The dynamics of having multiple unique watches and a darker, grittier art style. Also introduced is the idea of each yokai having two forms, a light side and a shadow side, which can be switched between. Unlike the later anime series, within the film, we're only introduced to the three teens, indicating that Shadowside was aimed at an older audience from the beginning. In the series, on the other hand, we also have the younger brother of one of the main trio, who is likely intended as a proxy for children who might still be watching. The film as a whole is darker in tone, art style, and theming, including the not-again-mentioned destruction of an entire city. The film straddles the line, continuing our story from long ago while pushing the series in a new direction. It's not as quirky as the previous film, but this entry remains good stuff all around, and a foundational bridge between the first and second arcs of the franchise. The Shadow Side series began broadcasting on April 13th, 2018, only two weeks after Yokai Watch was discontinued after 214 episodes. Shadow Side ran for almost a year between 2018 and 2019, stopping just shy of the 50 episode mark before being discontinued in late March 2019. Where Shinji Ushiro returned to direct the film before Shadow Side, the television series proper was helmed by Fumiya Hojo, while its writing credit was taken by series veteran Yoichi Kato. The series continued on the foundation built by the preceding movie, continuing its darker tone and art style, as well as creating a new flow for each episode and the show as a whole. Gone were the longer clip shows with bite-sized stories. Where each episode of Yokai Watch consists of three to five vignettes, one episode of Shadowside is a single entire story. This time, we're following the hijinks of a yokai detective agency, staffed by four kids who have connections with the yokai world. Two are watch wielders. One is a young kid who can see them, and one is another local kid who can use magic and communicate with yokai on his own. Even if Shadowside follows a Monster of the Week format, each episode builds upon one another similar to the collection of detective shorts in the previous show concerning Usepion and Inaho opening up their own agency. Shadowside was collectively a bold change for the franchise, offering a more teen-oriented, rougher type of presentation than the earlier anime series. It didn't last as long as it perhaps deserved, and it's never received an official release in English. Thanks to the efforts of the group Spectre Subs, however, the bulk of its episodes have been translated. So, if you missed out on this one for some reason, be sure to check it out when you get the chance. Besides Shadow Side, 2018 was a fairly large year for the franchise, offering a handful of new games in Japan as well as several international releases. First up, there was Yokai Sangokushi Kunitori Wars on January 11, 2018. This was another mobile release, this time a spin-off of a spin-off, based upon the Sangokushi 3DS game from earlier. 
Just the same as with the full game, this was developed by Koei Tecmo and Level 5 together. And similar to Sangokushi, this was another tactical RPG war game. Admittedly, given that this was a mobile game, its scale was reduced from the original version. A few months later, another mobile game titled Yokai Watch Getopo Rhythm was released on May 10th, 2018. This one was actually intended for release in 2017, but delayed until mid-2018, leaving 2017 as barren as it was. Getopo Rhythm is another side game. This time, a rhythm game, which, like the Just Dance title, features soundtrack picks from the anime series. This one, as far as we can tell, has quite a bit of personalization. Each yokai featured has a favorite instrument, each one enjoys different types of music, and everyone involved has their own personal flavor to add to the mix. Just over a month later, yet another mobile game hit Japan on June 27, 2018, in the form of Yokai Watch World. This game, developed by hugely prolific Japanese developer Goonhull, is an augmented reality game where players can go out and about in Japan and hunt for yokai in the world. Yeah, this is basically Yokai Watch Go. Not that we're knocking it, we haven't gotten to try it ourselves, but it seems like it's probably fun for what it's worth. Given that it's only been made available within Japan, international players can install the program on a phone or emulate it on their computer and simply spoof their location so they get yokai hunting from the comfort of the couch. The end of 2018 and the beginning of 2019 brought about a few more international releases and yet another film. To kick things off, we had the worldwide release of Yokai Watch Blasters in September 2018. But wait a minute, that doesn't sound right. Wasn't it Yokai Watch Busters? It seems that while the game was known as Busters in Japan, it was ultimately changed in English speaking territories, given that Level 5 was concerned about copyright infringement. Though the title is clearly a parody of Ghostbusters, and isn't meant to conflict with that series whatsoever, Level 5's English-speaking lawyers probably convinced them to swap the name, given how lawsuits are sort of the American way. When the two versions of the game were finally released in America, they were printed in such small quantities that they sold out rather quickly, even if the franchise had lost its luster in the West. We're kicking ourselves for not snapping these up when we had the chance, as now these games are more or less collector's items, with European copies being significantly cheaper than American versions. Even though the Blaster series weren't as well received compared with the main series games, they're some of the most expensive entries nowadays, but they're definitely not the most expensive. On December 7th, 2018 in Europe, and February 8th, 2019 in America, a single edition of Yokai Watch 3, based on the third iteration, Sukiyaki, was at long last released. The game was received well enough, but just as with Blasters, Nintendo seems to have lost confidence in not just the franchise, but perhaps even the 3DS, which was failing at the time. As such, Nintendo of America didn't produce too many units for the game. Given that it was a numbered entry, a late period game for the system, and a rarer game out of the box, within only a few months of release, Yokai Watch 3 was fetching double, if not triple or more, of its list price. If you're interested in breaking into the series, this one definitely won't be the cheapest entry, but it's a worthwhile addition to your collection if you can shell out the cash for it, and if you've already played the first two and know that you're into the series. Just an update on this part, I wrote this back in June or July when these prices were actually higher than they are for Busters now, but it seems like looking, looking at this, uh, the prices for Busters have continued to increase and the prices for Yokai Watch 3 have stabilized. Also in December 2018, Japan saw the release of the fifth theatrical film, Yokai Watch Forever Friends. This was the second film to be based within the Shadowside timeline, and capped off the series with a prequel. Yokai Watch 2, the game, and Yokai Watch 1, the movie, saw Keita and company traveling back to the past to encounter Keita's grandfather and his group of yokai. With Forever Friends, on the other hand, the production crew got rid of the time travel aspect and served up a full-on story set entirely in 1960s Tokyo. Notable for this film was a lack of one Shinji Ushiro whose directorial chair was instead filled exclusively by Shigeharu Takahashi, who had previously worked on the first two Yokai Watch films. Forever Friends concerns itself with a completely new cast of characters exploring the Yokai world prior to all events we've seen previously. 
It's an impressive film, given that it has the duty of setting up a completely new set of circumstances in a universe which has grown as large as this. And despite this difficult task, the film passes with flying colors, as in less than two hours it makes us care about these characters deeply, while further building the lore of the yokai world. We won't spoil much about this one, but suffice it to say that Forever Friends is both a solid entry into the series, and a good starting place. Truly, it seems that in reverse of the norm for most franchises, the yokai watch movies got better with each successive entry, meaning that of the first five, the fifth may be the best. Additionally, given that it's unrestrained by the rest of the series, occurring before the other events on display, it proves to be a quality, more or less self-contained story which will be loved by both fans and newcomers alike. In April 2019, only one week after the conclusion of the short-lived Shadowside anime, an even shorter-lived series was introduced after its replacement. This anime, simply titled Yokai Watch, see it's got an exclamation point now, that's how you know it's different. It's usually referred to on the English-speaking internet as Yokai Watch 2019. It returns the show to the original art style and atmosphere of the original series, dropping the more teen-oriented angle of the preceding series. The project was directed by Ryosuke Senbo and penned by Yoichi Kato. This version of Yokai Watch only ran for 36 episodes, not even outlasting the calendar year. And given how the original series and Shadowside never saw complete runs in America, yeah, it's likely this one isn't coming our way anytime soon. Midway through 2019, a new entry into the main series dropped for the first time in three years. The 3DS was done for at this point, so Level 5 switched its focus to the explosively popular Nintendo Switch. This game, simply titled Yokai Watch 4, saw release on June 20th in a single version. No more of this double or triple version business. The game was actually supposed to be released at the end of 2018, but suffered several unexplained delays before its eventual release in the summer of 2019. The game did see an update in December, however, titled Yokai Watch 4 Plus Plus, which added several new game areas, new befriendable yokai, and a multiplayer mode. 4 Plus Plus also proved an important step for the series, as it saw release on the PlayStation 4 as well and the base game also introduced Chinese language support into the main series of games. At Anime Expo 2019, the game was confirmed for an American localization, though details are still scarce as to when and how this might happen, specifically whether it will be both console versions of the game, or just one of them. With Yokai Watch 4, the game was directed once more by Motomura, and produced and written as per usual by Hino. Hino implied in 2017 that the length of time spent waiting for this entry was so long because he wanted the series to receive a refresh. Yokai Watch 3's sales floundered a bit compared with those for Yokai Watch 2, and in turn, Yokai Watch 4 doesn't seem to have fared much better in spite of this longer development period. The game introduced several major advancements for the series, namely a fully third-person view with a movable camera and a snazzy new battle system which functions more like an action RPG rather than a turn-based affair. Additionally, the game draws a great deal of influence from the franchise's Shadowside branch, bringing Shadowside Yokai into the main series for the first time. A Western release for Yokai Watch 4 was confirmed back in mid-2019, even before the release for 4++. But as of now, there's still no news on when this localization might see release, nor whether we'll see the game on Switch only, or if the PS4 version will make it this way as well. The rest of 2019 was quite uneventful for the franchise, beginning with another mobile game for Android and iOS. This one, however, was remarkable for being a full-on RPG experience. Yokai Watch Metal Wars was published on July 30th, 2019, developed in conjunction by Netmarble Corporation and Level 5. Netmarble is a Korean developer known for their mobile games, particularly their licensed works and RPGs. In Metal Wars, players create avatars based upon themselves, rather than selecting one of the pre-existing characters in the universe of the franchise. Metal Wars has been noted positively for containing a brand new story for the series. Though, of course, there is no English translation as of yet. Of course. As well as for introducing a new mode of play. You might think that the original series took advantage of the touchscreen on the Nintendo 3DS in order to help the player interact with the game world. This, on the other hand, is a whole other beast. 
With Metal Wars, the entire battle system seems to be based around touchscreen swipes. The overworld has been truncated into a map on which players select the areas and levels to which they wish to travel. Once new areas are entered, story cutscenes and battles will commence, with the player assisting their yokai as they battle through one screen after another progressing vertically through each level. Outside of battle, players can spend in-game currency to receive new yokai from the series staple, Krenkakai, hang out with their yokai in the player's house, and even take part in battles against owners of the yokai watch. Metal Wars seems to be a fairly fleshed out experience, which unfortunately is only available in Japan as of now. One more major video game release remained for 2019, this time a callback to the franchise's origins. Released October 10th, 2019, Yokai Watch 1 for Nintendo Switch showed off what Nintendo's newest console could do in terms of upgrading the original game for a new era. Yokai Watch 1 for Nintendo Switch proved to be an updated and reimagined port of the first game for the Nintendo Switch, with a whole host of updates. It mostly brought the game up to the quality and standards represented with Yokai Watch 4, thanks to all of the improvements made in the series over the years. The newest iteration of Yokai Watch 1 doesn't shake things up too heavily in terms of gameplay, however. The battle system in play here is the same classic version players will remember from the series' first entry, rather than the real time battle implemented in Yokai Watch 4. The graphics, on the other hand, have been fully updated and brought into the current generation. While we couldn't find sales figures for the game, reception seems to be positive for the most part. Unfortunately, as with most all iterations of the franchise over the past several years, we have yet to receive any information whether Yokai Watch 1 for Nintendo Switch will make it into English-speaking territories anytime soon. If ever. 2019 was closed out with its annual theatrical release, this time branching out in a completely different direction. The film was released a week prior to the conclusion of the renewed Yokai Watch anime, and a few weeks before the premiere of another new series. Released December 13th, 2019, Yokai Watch Jamu, Ega Yokai Gakuen Wai, Neko wa Hiro ni Nareru ka. In English, Yokai Watch Jam, Yokai Academy Wai, the movie, can a cat be a hero? Introduced the world to a completely different parallel universe. In this case, the film is exploring an academy which is attended by anthro versions of the yokai we've come to know and love over the years. This means that our heroes have to contend not just with the mysteries of the yokai world, but also the horrors of… grade school. Unfortunately, as of this writing, the film is recent enough that the ever-faithful subtitling group Spectre Subs hasn't gotten around to wrapping up their translation of the film yet. We'll be sure to check out the film once it's available, but this meant that we weren't able to actually see it in time for this video. Regardless, we should take a moment here to shout out Spectre Subs once more, a small collective whom you can find over on Twitter or their homepage, who have been tirelessly translating and subtitling Yokai Watch in its numerous incarnations for years now. Seriously, without them, this video would never have happened. And outside of the video games, which have continued to make it stateside, at least the main series ones. We may argue that Spectre Subs have been one of the few entities keeping the fandom thriving in the English-speaking world. Be sure to show Spectre Subs some love and keep an eye out for their many, many releases. Though the latest film was not available to us while working on this video, Spectre Subs has already begun working on the latest series. The newest anime series, as of this video's production, premiered on December 27th, 2019, being titled Yokai Watch Jam. Yokai Gakuen Wai, En Tono Sogu, or Yokai Watch Jam, Yokai Academy Wai, Close Encounters of the N Kind. This series, as with Shadowside and its preceding film, picks up where the 2019 film left off, further exploring the world of the Academy set up in the movie. Together, our favorite anthro yokai delve into the various enigmas of Wai Academy, and combat some typical tropes of the school anime like a powerful student council, or various clubs with their own aims and quirks. As of this writing, Close Encounters of the End Kind is still ongoing, clocking in at around 40 episodes so far, and with no sign of slowing down. And lastly, let us close off this retrospective on the Yokai Watch franchise with Level 5's latest release, Yokai Watch Jam, Yokai Academy Wai, Waiwai Gakuen Sekatsu. 
This new entry, based upon the most recent anime and film portion of the series, serves as something of a marriage between Persona and Yokai Watch. That's because, in addition to existing in the side universe created for this new portion of the franchise, Jam's gameplay takes a new form. In short, this is not merely a monster collecting RPG, but a school life simulator RPG, where the player can interact and build relationships with a number of other students at Y Academy. The game saw its initial release on the Nintendo Switch on August 13, 2020. A PS4 version was announced, which seems to imply that for the foreseeable future, Level 5 and Hino will be continuing this dual market approach with the Yokai Watch franchise. There's no word yet on an English language release for this spin off from the main series, nor has Level 5 made any announcements yet about a fifth numbered entry nor had there been any announcements concerning a seventh film for the franchise. Which, when you consider this video as being made in 2020, understandable. For fans of Yokai Watch, it may appear to be an uncertain time, given the waning love for the franchise both at home and abroad. But we're all thankful that Nintendo and Level 5 continue to take risks on translating and exporting pieces of the franchise, mainly the games, even if the show and movies have stopped coming our way. Also thankfully, given the continued and diligent efforts of fan groups like Spectre Subs, who you can follow over on Twitter for current updates on their translation efforts, or Abdallah Smash, who you can find here on YouTube, the pieces of the franchise which wouldn't otherwise be available to English speakers have made their way into our hands over the years. Seriously, we owe these folks and everyone like them a huge debt of gratitude for all their hard work, as this video, again, would never have been possible without the huge amount of material open to us through people like Spectre Subs and Abdallah Smash. Check out their work through the links in the description, and be sure to show your thanks. Believe it or not, even after all that we've said today about Yokai Watch, we're still not done. In this video, we've taken a lengthy look at the history of the franchise and spoken a bit concerning each iteration about which we have some information. What we haven't explored here is how and why, by 2016, everyone but Nintendo seemed to have dropped Yokai Watch from their minds. In the latter half of this video, you might have heard a certain phrase over and over again. Well, tomorrow you all ought to come right back here to Cinema Nippon because this story isn't over yet. In our next video, we'll be celebrating Halloween, the best holiday on the books, and rounding out our month of Octoberween by putting on our sleuthing caps and taking a closer look into the case of the forgotten yokai, aka the case of why the franchise was dropped like a hot plate of cookies by someone not holding an oven mitt as soon as the going stopped getting good. So turn your collar up to the wind, put on your private eye hat, and meet us here around sundown tomorrow. Eastern Standard Time, where we'll be spilling the beans on just what happened to Yokai Watch in America.